Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST app, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 44 in our series for 2021, and today's date is Friday, December the 3rd. First, I'll be talking to Frontier Pets founder, Diana Scott, to discuss how Frontier Pets is helping put an end to the 500 million Australian animals stuck in factory farming, and how they've created an additional source of income for Australian farmers. And I'll be talking to economist Saul Leslake about how Australia will manage the recovery. But now, let's talk to Diana Scott. Diana, tell us about Frontier Pets. Uh, you've, you're putting an end to animals stuck in factory farming and you've developed all these partnerships to ensure Australians get quality cuts of beef, chicken, pork and egg. How does it work? Okay. So I'm on a mission, on a vision to stop factory farming and I, uh, from a personal point of view, I eat free range produce and I donate to advocacy groups. But I wanted to do something much more significant than that. I thought if I want to end factory farming, I need to do something, I need to make a huge impact uh, in this ethical farming community. And I was, you know, it was just really serendipitous. I was looking at my pet food. I was thinking, well, this looks not only unappetising, but I don't know what's in it. So I did some research and found out that the the pet food manufacturing industry props up factory farming by using the offcuts of factory farmed animals. So I was on a mission to find an ethically sourced pet food and I couldn't find one. And I spoke to a, an animal nutritionist and said, this is what I want to do. And she said, well, there's nothing around. You're just going to have to feed raw. So you'd have to cut up all of these ingredients and feed your dog. So that would, that would take all of my Sunday and all of my freezer space. And I stumbled across a, a technique called freeze drying which is extremely popular in the States and in New Zealand, but not not so well known here in Australia. And I thought that's a way to do it. Freeze drying is, is such an extraordinary way of preserving food and the, the output is fantastic. So I went back to the pet nutritionist and said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a significant impact. So we worked on the formulation for probably about 18 months and did some testing. And I launched the product in uh, January of 2017. And it's, uh, I have a, pit, a pork, a chicken and a beef, as uh, you rightly asked. And they contain, all of them contain free range meat, free range offal, organic fruit and vegetables and free range eggs. So, well, what I did is actually visited all the farmers, all the free range farmers around the East Coast and said, can you supply me with produce? And they did. And, and so I have partnerships with farmers who uh, practice free range methods and they, farmers who also sell to restaurants and so on. So they've got their, the cuts that they sell to restaurants, the cuts that they sell to supermarkets and then the, the stuff that they sell to us. So that's how it's happened. And in the last three and a half years, you know, I've gone from having 75 direct customers to eight and a half thousand. So there is definitely a call for this kind of product. And, and importantly, we've spent $1.4 million on ethical produce. So we've gone from, I've gone from someone that's donated money to advocacy groups to investing, you know, one and a half million dollars in the ethical farming community. So, and with the idea of, of taking business away from the factory farms. So it's working very well. So who, who are your customers? Uh, I have mainly direct customers, so I sell mainly direct. I do sell through a few resellers, uh, uh, the vets and so on, that have approached us. But I mainly sell directly to the consumer. So I launched, uh, so I've got an e-commerce site. So I launched 
the product out to the wider community. People that are interested in in two aspects of the business or, or the product. One is the actual nutritional content because it's off the charts good. It's just so good. And the animal welfare part of it as well. So there is this, this combination of people who want to feed their pets well and also care about ending factory farming the way that we do. So there are those two types of people. Uh, they're mainly women. M women do, and it doesn't mean that men don't care about the environment about or about animal welfare, but the women are the ones that actually usually buy the product. Well, the women are the ones who usually put the food on the table. That's exactly right. And this, and, and, and the, the type of peace people that we have are the ones that really want to uh, not just do the right thing by their pet, but have more of a meaningful uh, mealtime relationship. I know that sounds bizarre, but you know that dogs have gone from the backyard to the bedroom. They're part of the family now. They're, they're, you know, they're very much seen as part of the family. And to put a, you know, a dry kibble in a bowl and just feed the dog the dry kibble is, is not very... It's just like, oh, well, I'm just going to give you this stuff. But with... Frontier Pet Food, they put the dry ingredients in the bowl and then they add water back into it. So the freeze drying has, take, has taken out the water. We've added the water back into the product to, to reconstitute it to its original raw form. And what happens when you add the warm water is that it smells amazing and the dogs are hanging around waiting for this meal. So suddenly you've got this connection between yourself and your pet at meal times, I mean, it only takes 30 seconds. It's not like I'll leave it there for half an hour. It only takes 30 seconds, but you've suddenly got, oh, I've prepared food for my pet very in a very easy way that I feel good about feeding. And the, and the dogs love it. They just lick the bowl clean because it's exactly like re feeding raw food without any of the hassles. So... You know, that's the kind of personality that we're talking about as well. We're not just talking about, you know, people that throw their dogs food and then and then leave them outside all day. We're talking about people's connection with their pets. Now, are your customers from all over Australia? All over Australia. All over Australia. We've got quite a few customers in Perth and uh, for some reason. Uh, but, yes, spread all over Australia. And we send all over Australia. And we send the same day. So usually people get their product within a day or two. And that's all from your e-commerce site? That's all from our e-commerce site. So we manufacture, so we're based in Evans Head in northern New South Wales. So we actually manufacture ourselves. We don't outsource anything. So we have a full manufacturing and fulfilment facility and warehouse here. So all of our food is made and uh, packed and sent from here. Yeah. How many people do you have working for you? Fifteen. So we went from literally three years ago when I was in my study at home and I had a dining and a lounge room full of dog food to a full facility where we employ 15 people. And Evans Head's quite a small town, but there's, we, we're right up there in terms of our employees. It's great. What's wonderful is that we can offer you know, people, a lot of flexibility. So, you know, we've got young mothers, you know, uh, you know, grandparents that just want to work a few hours a day. So we are able to offer that, that kind of flexibility with people here. And we actually, sorry, you're probably going to ask me this, but, you know, we've become quite a thing in Evans Head because we, we're quite a lot, we're a reasonably larger company now and, and we've won quite a local, a few industry awards here, which is, which is all based around what we're giving back to the local community as well in terms of employment. So we won Business of the Year last year, which was, which was wonderful, and manufacturing and innovation and a bunch of other things. So, yeah, I'm really proud of that. Leon, I think that's, that's just fantastic to be able to offer people different ways to work with us that fits in with their lifestyle as well. And, and you also uh, have developed special suppliers of pork, beef and eggs, haven't you? 
Yes, we've got uh, our local, we, we've dealt with a few different producers and our pork comes very, it's very local. <laughs> it's in Borrowdale, so it's very local. And um, our chicken comes from WA actually, but we're talking to some other people in Queensland. And um, our beef comes all over New, from all over New South Wales and Victoria. So, but we're starting to talk to some other smaller companies as well because our because our business is growing so much. We need to talk to companies that are that are able to supply us. But we are now spreading a little bit to the smaller farmers that we can deal with directly and have a number of different suppliers locally. All of our fruit and vegetables come locally as well. So that everything gets delivered every week. Everything's fresh every week. So you'll be uh, increasing your uh, supply chain quite massively. Yeah, we will. And it's also so that we can we can meet our consumer demand. But what it's also doing, which I think is really, really cool, is that we are about to export to Korea. That is, we weren't quite ready to export yet, but Korea was really hammering us. And so what we're able to do is... For the companies that are supplying us with produce, they now have a, a way to export their product without having to directly export their product, if you know what I mean. So we're giving them a value add. So we've got our, our ex suppliers, um, we use a, a local ex supplier called, here called Possum Creek. Now they couldn't possibly export their product. They're not in a position to export fresh eggs. But that we use their fresh eggs in our product and then we export our product. So we're actually increasing the demand for their product in areas that they couldn't they, they wouldn't possibly have been able to do. Are there any other countries you export to? We we don't export we we've been asked by Japan and the States and New Zealand. Uh, Singapore is knocking at our door in China. But we want to Leon, there is enough here to fulfill the market here. And we are very, very focused on getting our Australian market really well established and our production really well streamlined. There is, if we look at it, this in context, Australians spend just under $4 billion a year on pet food. So you don't need to do much you, it, there's so much market here. You know, you, you don't need to go to China. You don't need to go to go elsewhere. And, and then in the same way that I want to focus on Australia is that all of our produce is Australian and it's it's very much that kind of community aspect of it. So it doesn't mean we won't export. As I said, Korea, where they were very, very keen on our produce, Koreans in particular are very keen on Australian produce. And then when you add that extra layer of the fact that it's ethical and it's free range and there's no hormones and there's no grain and all of those things that they've had to put up with for so long. So yeah, eventually, but you know, even in three years, we could be so big that we just, it would be quite challenging. Well, Diana, it's a fascinating business and congratulations and wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. You're extremely welcome. My Thank pleasure. You. And now let's talk to economist Saul Eslake. Saul, how do you think the Australia will go about its economic recovery in 2022? Well, I think we will see a very strong rebound in economic activity in the current quarter after what I describe as the recession we experienced in the September quarter. We didn't have two quarters in a row of negative growth, which many people use as the definition of a recession. As I think we've discussed before, I think that's a very silly definition. The effective unemployment rate rose from 5.7% in May to 10.3% in September and October, if you include the people who were officially employed but didn't work any hours and add back the people who lost their jobs and dropped out of the labour force rather than actively looking for work as they wouldn't have been allowed to do in New South Wales or Victoria during that period. But given the strength of demand uh, for a range of goods and services that we're seeing exhibited now, even though it hasn't been captured in official statistics for November, given the high level of job vacancies, given that people are willing and keen to return to work, 
I think will make up the shortfall in economic activity in the September quarter by some time during the first quarter of next year. Now, the experience in the aftermath of the big lockdown in 2020 and the experience of other countries that have regained their pre-pandemic levels of economic activity tells us that once you have, economic growth then tends to return to the pattern it had before the onset of the pandemic, which in Australia's case, like that of most other advanced economies, wasn't all that flash. You know, prior to the onset of the pandemic, Australia's economy was growing at about a two and a half percent pace, and more than two thirds of that was coming from population growth, mainly as a result of immigration, rather than from real improvements in people's living standards that economists identify by movements in per capita GDP growth. And there's nothing that I can see that says Australia is going to experience sustained above trend growth in economic activity once we get back to pre-pandemic or pre-lockdown levels of economic activity, which we should have done by the first quarter of next year. And yes, certainly households have accumulated a considerable volume of savings, which they will probably spend. But my guess is that immigration will return gradually rather than quickly to its pre-pandemic levels. We may, for example, not get the same influx of students from China as we were getting prior to the onset of the pandemic because of the deterioration in the bilateral relationship between Australia and China that to date has shown up in Chinese boycotts of various exports of goods like coal and barley and wine and so forth. But we don't yet know what impact that will have on international education and tourism, which are also pre-pandemic, at least important areas of our trade. At some point, I think in 2023, interest rates will start going up. And there are various other challenges that I think the Australian economy faces, including whoever is the government after the next election decides to do by way of reining in the budget deficit that has blown out during the pandemic. So my sense is that after a burst of growth in the fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of 2022, economic growth is probably going to settle back to a more sedate pace of about two to two and a half percent per annum. Which means over the economy wasn't traveling that flash pre-pandemic. So we would be back at that state, wouldn't we? Well, that's what seems to be the most likely scenario. The upside perhaps is that the Reserve Bank now accepts, as does the government, that inflation isn't going to take off with an unemployment rate of 5%. Uh, there's a good chance that we'll get the unemployment rate down to four uh, percent i think possibly by the second half of next year depending on how quickly immigration resumes and at that point hopefully we'll see some pickup in wages growth that's certainly what the reserve bank is looking for before it begins returning interest rates to more normal levels from their current record lows but i don't really see anything else on the horizon that says there are solid grounds for believing that Australia is going to achieve three and a half to four percent economic growth from 2022 through to 2025, for example. What would we need to have to get Australia's economic growth to three and a half to four percent? Well, I think we need a combination of things rather than there being any single answer, single magic bullet that would produce an outcome like that. I think sustained levels of infrastructure investment on well-chosen projects that will produce long-term economic benefits would help. Stronger growth sustained in dwelling construction would probably help. If we had a coherent energy policy that provided certainty about electricity pricing and other aspects of Australia's energy markets that created the conditions for sustained private investment in low emissions, electricity generation and transport, that would certainly help. 
But you have to set against that the headwinds that we're likely to face from higher interest rates in the United States and possibly other overseas economies, a slowing Chinese economy, as well as probably no improvement in the current state of bilateral relationships with our major trading partner, China, the risks to our exports posed by the perception that Australia isn't pulling its weight when it comes to reducing its own CO2 emissions, with the possibility that Australia's exports could therefore become subject to what are called carbon tariffs in other markets such as the United States, Europe, Japan and Korea, which would adversely affect potentially a wide range of Australia's exports, as well as the absence of anything that provides any basis for confidence that Australia's poor productivity performance in the second half of the past decade is all of a sudden going to be improved in the next five years or so. Uh, How can we go about improving productivity? That seems to be one of the big issues now. Yeah, and, and there's a complex array of factors that explain the deterioration in productivity in Australia over the past decade. And I should emphasize that they're by no means unique to Australia. Slow productivity growth is something that's been observed all over the advanced world and indeed in some emerging economies as well. Some of it appears to be due to the inability of what are called laggard firms to capture and deploy technological advances in the most advanced firms. And that's probably in part a byproduct of the nature of new emerging technologies themselves, that it's very easy for those firms who develop advances in technology to protect their intellectual property and to increase their market power and drive competitors out of markets. We've certainly seen that on the global stage and there are elements of it in Australia and that probably acts as a drag on productivity growth. Uh, Something that communities and politicians find hard to understand is that a key driver of productivity growth is labor and capital moving out of poorly performing firms into better performing firms and out of low productivity industries into higher productivity industries. And we have, like many other countries, do a whole suite of policies that intentionally or otherwise prevent that happening. So very low interest rates, for example, is a factor that helps prop up firms that would otherwise go out of business, tax preferences and other subsidies for small business simply because they're small and for no other reason can have the same effect of perpetuating the existence of poorly performing firms in a way that acts as a drag on productivity. Uh, But there are other things where perhaps the solutions are more obvious, though nonetheless politically challenging. That includes the deteriorating performance of Australia's education system. So studies of assessments of student performance show Australia continually slipping relative to other countries in the knowledge and skills that are being imparted to our students. And that obviously must detract from productivity as well over longer periods of time. Final question. We're we're assuming there'll be interest rate rises in 2022, possibly, and certainly in 2023. What impact will that have? Well, the financial markets are certainly assuming that there will be two increases in interest rates in 2022, despite the Reserve Bank pushing back fairly forcefully against that idea, saying that current data and forecasts don't warrant increases in interest rates next year. Uh, I have some sympathy with that view. I think that the most likely time for the first increase in interest rates is in the second quarter of 2023, by which time the unemployment rate will have been around 4% for sufficiently long for wages growth to have picked up to over the 3% margin that the Reserve Bank thinks is consistent with consumer price inflation being sustainably within its 2 to 3% range, rather than just maybe 0.1 percentage point above it, uh, the bottom end of that range as it is at the moment. So, you know, I, I don't think 
at the moment that Australian rates will go up next year. I think US rates will certainly go up next year, and that'll probably result in a further decline in the Australian dollar, which the Reserve Bank and many others will actually welcome because of the boost it will give to competitiveness of Australian exporters and to economic growth more broadly. That'll be an additional form of stimulus at a time when for example, higher rates in the US will probably have some adverse consequences for financial markets and for share markets in particular. But uh, when interest rates do go up, that's likely to dampen the demand for housing and lead to at least a levelling out in property prices. There'll be a small number of Australian households who will have to rein in their spending in order to maintain their financial commitments at higher interest rates. But the Reserve Bank knows all of these things. And when it does move interest rates, I'm sure it will be moving them very gradually and in small amounts. Well, Saul, so like, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for all your help during the year. And that's been a pleasure. Uh, I hope um, all the people who listen to these podcasts have an enjoyable festive season and a prosperous new year. So what's happening in the news? Well, the Omicron variant of COVID-19 adds new measures of uncertainty to the outlook for the global economy, although it is too soon to adequately quantify that risk. Much will depend on its speed of transmission, virulence, associated rates of hospitalisation and death, and also the effectiveness of vaccines and antiviral medications against it. It will be at least two more weeks before more will be known as scientists around the world build a better understanding of the new variant and as the severity of infections becomes clearer. The fate of global markets now depends at least in part on laboratories around the world probing the Omicron COVID-19 strain, potentially leaving investors with weeks of uncertainty in the wait for answers. The variant detected in Africa is described as highly concerning and has already led to international travel bans. Scientists are analysing whether it can evade vaccines and how its symptoms differ from current strains. Vaccine maker BioNTech SE expects the first data within two weeks initial findings that will help to determine if a passing scare or bigger hit to global economic reopening looms. Fearful investors fled stocks worldwide Friday and flocked to havens such as sovereign bonds as volatility spiked. The window for more clarity on Omicron to emerge may be two to eight weeks during which demand for riskier assets could take a hit, according to Citigroup Inc. strategists, including Jamie Fay and Yasmin Nunes. At a minimum, volatility will be higher in the next two weeks, Peter Berezin, Chief Global Strategist at BCA Research Inc. told Bloomberg. And rising COVID-19 cases and the new Omicron variant could imperil the economic recovery and exacerbate inflationary pressures, Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell told US, US legislators on Tuesday. In testimony delivered at a joint congressional hearing with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Mr Powell said that while US consumer demand remains buoyant and workers are returning to the workforce, the possibility of coronavirus pandemic-related setbacks is clouding the economic outlook. With Japan, Israel, Morocco and South Korea shutting down foreign travel and Australia and several European nations closing their borders to travellers from South Africa, the travel industry has again been thrown into turmoil due to a new variant of the COVID-19 virus. Cruise company p Cruises Australia has further extended its ban for at least another month, revealing that it has no plans to sail from Sydney and Brisbane until March 3rd. Earlier this month, p Cruises Australia also cancelled next year's scheduled season for Adelaide, Fremantle and Cairns. p Cruises Australia President Stur Miermel said recent speculation about the lifting of the ban on cruise ships has been encouraging, but uncertainty continues around the resumption of cruising in Australia. Meanwhile, local travel agents are frustrated by the micron variant, saying it could not come at a worse time, as travel business, particularly lucrative leisure travel, was just starting to recover. Hello World Chief Executive Andrew Burns, who runs thousands of retail outlets throughout Australia and New Zealand, said some of his clients have cancelled their looming international trips over the past few days due to Omicron. And Scott Morrison and state premiers are holding the line against domestic border closures and new COVID-19 lockdowns, agreeing until more is known about the risk of a new Omicron variant, Australia must keep pushing towards a Christmas reopening. At a national cabinet meeting held late on Tuesday, Commonwealth Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly said it would be two weeks before a fuller picture of the threat from the newly declared variant of concern was cleared. He told Premiers and Chief Ministers that no evidence yet existed to suggest COVID-19 vaccines were not working against Omicron, first identified in Africa last week. Professor Kelly said there was no evidence to suggest the variant would lead to more serious illness than the deadly Delta strain. 
While Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk said earlier that moves by countries such as Israel and Japan to close international borders suggested Omicron was more serious than previous strains, it was pointed out in the SNAP talks that those countries were aligning themselves with Australia's existing border stance. Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews, who held talks with Qantas Chief Executive Alan Joyce on Tuesday, said the federal government was wise to delay arrivals of foreign students and skilled workers by two weeks, but he would keep his state borders open because the consequences of closing would be very significant. And Prime Minister Scott Morrison has threatened to intervene and break the industrial gridlock on the nation's ports unless the Maritime Union of Australia and, and Patrick Terminals negotiate a resolution to their months-long dispute. Declaring the efficient operation of ports critical to the economic recovery, Mr Morrison has also flagged longer-term substantive legislative change to break the power of the MUA. He said Treasurer Josh Frydenberg had charged the Productivity Commission to look at the broader issues hampering the productivity of, of Australia's ports. The inquiry would include an examination of recent criticisms by the Australian Competition Consumer Commission of the poor performance of Australia's ports, exacerbated by the MUA's enterprise bargaining deals. The ACCC said they contributed to the suboptimal performance of the nation's major ports and added to the pandemic-induced supply constraints by hampering productivity and increasing disruptions. The Productivity Commission would report by the middle of next year, just after the federal election, setting the scene for a pre-election fight and, should the coalition win wolf a fourth successive term, an early pursuit of a reform agenda. And the Australian economy has contracted by 1.9% during the September quarter, with lockdowns in place in New South Wales and Victoria for most of the period. Economists have been expecting a contraction of 2.7%. On an annualised basis, however, the economy grew by 3.9%. Economists have been forecasting growth of 3%. And Westpac faces a $130 million fine after corporate rock watchdog took the unprecedented step of launching six lawsuits against the bank simultaneously, including one for charging fees from 11,000 dead clients. The Australian Securities Investments Commission, ASIC, said the six separate investigations into the bank, some of which were raised at the 2018 Banking Royal Commission, had uncovered major problems with the lenders' processes, systems and governance. Mm -hmm. Due to the exceptional circumstances, the watchdog has expedited the matters to have them heard by a court as soon as practical. Westpac has admitted to all the allegations against it, and the bank will pay about $80 million in compensation, and it and ASIC will jointly submit that the court imposes a fine of $113 million. The lawsuits are another blow for Westpac, as it tries to recover from a tumultuous two-year period since a lender was thrown into turmoil by a money laundering compliance scandal in late 2019. In one of the lawsuits launched on Tuesday, ASIC said that over a 10-year period, Westpac charged $10 million in fees for financial advice to 11,000 clients who had died. In another, the bank sold duplicate insurance policies to more than 7,000 customers for the same property, meaning some customers needlessly paid for two or more insurance policies. A separate action said Westpac-owned BT Funds Management charged insurance premiums that included commissions, despite the commissions being banned under laws introduced by the Gillard government. BT was paying $12 million in compensation to more than 8,000 people affected, ASIC said. A fourth lawsuit took aim at $7 million in financial advice fees charged to at least 25,000 people, saying the fees were either not disclosed or inadequately disclosed. There is also a lawsuit alleging the bank allowed 21,000 deregistered company bank accounts to remain open, which meant to charge fees on accounts and allowed money to, to be withdrawn that should have been given to ASIC or the federal government. And in the final case, ASIC said Westpac had on-sold debt with incorrect interest rates, which meant that more than 16,000 customers were overcharged. ASIC said more than $17 million had been refunded over this matter. And Australians spent more than an estimated $8 billion across the four days, from Black Friday to Cyber Monday, according to NAB analysis of merchant transactions. In a clear boost for Australian businesses, the promotional holiday beat pre-pandemic records from 2019, with sales up by 8%. The strongest performers in the period for in-person purchases were technology retailers, with sales up by 168% on 2019. Shoe store sales were up by 92% for the same period, while jewellery stores were up by 49%, and clothing sales were up 54%. The strongest performer in the period for online retailers was jewellery and watch stores, with sales up 312% on 2019. And Australia Post will deliver parcels to customers in Sydney and Melbourne ahead of Christmas, with the first of 20 electric trucks in its national fleet, as part of a plan to edge towards carbon neutral deliveries. Australia Post is already the largest electric vehicle operator in Australia, with a fleet of 3,000. 
more than 2,100 D trucks, the three-wheel delivery vehicles that can run on this part with another 2,000 on the way, and 1,400 electric bicycles. But the purchase of what were the world's first all-electric trucks in 2017, made by Mitsubishi Fuso Truck and Bus Corporation, which produce zero emissions and little noise, expands Australia's post fleet into heavy assets and beyond last mile deliveries. And the Morrison government has given itself the option of a May 7 election at the earliest, should it choose to hand down another federal budget before going to the polls. Alternatively, should it choose not to have another budget, mid-March would be the most likely date for the election, at which the coalition is seeking a fourth successive term. The timetable for next year's parliamentary sittings released on Monday has brought the budget forward from its usual spot of the second Tuesday in May to March 29. If Prime Minister Scott Morrison were to call the election at the end of the week, the earliest it could be held would be Saturday, May the 7th, which would be almost three years since the previous election on May the 18th, 2019. Waiting for a budget before calling an election would require the government to endure three weeks of parliament, including the budget week. The government typically struggles when parliament meets, and Mrs Morrison is keeping open the option of calling an election in early February for mid-March. And Jack Dorsey has resigned from Twitter on Twitter. In a resignation letter, he said after 16 years, he decided it was time to leave. Mrs Dorsey said the changes take effect immediately, although he will remain on the board to help with the transition until Mayish. I want you all to know this was my decision and I own it, Mr Dorsey wrote, adding, I'm really sad, yet really happy. Mr Dorsey will be succeeded as Chief Executive by Parag Agrawal. Brett Taylor was named the new Chairman of the company's board, succeeding Patrick Pichet. Dr Agrawal joined Twitter in 2011 and has served as Chief Technology Officer since October 2017. He holds a PhD in Computer Science from Stanford University. The surprise move ends Dorsey's much criticised tenure as Chief Executive Officer of both Twitter and Square, his digital payments company, which led to Twitter stakeholders Elliott Management and billionaire investor Paul Singer calling on him to step down from one of those roles. Investors and some staff have questioned Dorsey's management style and have worried that he is stretched too thin by his roles at both companies. In 2019, he announced plans to relocate to Africa for six months, a move that worried both staff and investors. He scrapped the plan after the coronavirus pandemic struck. His stakes in Twitter and Square have helped Dorsey amass a personal fortune of over $12 billion, according to Forbes. In April, Dorsey announced he was giving $1 billion to relief programs related to the coronavirus, girls' health and education, and the study of universal basic income and financial payments to people. And a Grattan Institute report has argued for a bond-funded $20 billion social housing future fund, allowing the creation of an extra 3,000 social housing units a year to tackle the existing shortfall and growing demand for secure housing for low-income Australians. The Institute said the federal government already managed six funds worth a collective $247.8 billion, including the $199.1 billion future fund, and a social housing fund that started next year could build 24,000 additional dwellings by 2030 and 54,000 by 2040. The lack of investment is a growing problem. The country's 430,000 social housing dwellings, accommodation for the lowest income Australians who pay rents capped at 25% of household income, has dropped to just 4% of total stock from 6% in 1991, the report shows. Social housing is a crucial part of the infrastructure puzzle to allow lower income people to play a productive part in the economy and also to give them a chance to prepare their own financial future. And zero alcohol craft brewer Heaps Normal has raised $8.5 million in capital from a range of investors, including Adore Beauty founder Kate Moss and the co-founder of Echo Toilet Paper Outfit, Who Gives a Crap, Simon Griffiths. Heaps Normal Chief Executive Andy Miller said the craft beer group began selling its first products in July 2020 and is expecting volume growth to be 8.5 times higher in 2021-22 as the zero alcohol category expands quickly, driven by sharper focus on health and well-being. Mr Miller said being a pure play zero alcohol company that does not make any alcoholic beers gives the company extra credibility. He said the pandemic had been the catalyst for many people to pay closer attention to their health and well-being and this had helped accelerate growth in the broader zero alcohol category. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Grant Emanuel, Global Marketing Director for the Chamberlain Group, Australia's leading manufacturer in garage door openers and accessories, embracing change and adopting a nimble approach to the ever-evolving economic landscape. Emmanuel has navigated a new world of online-led strategy, virtual office banter and a more adaptive approach to accommodating the needs of individual markets with different economic, social and health circumstances. 
and I'll be talking to IFM Investors economist Alex Joyner about the outlook for 2022. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe and healthy